So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to wrap up the discussion of factory method by talking about the pros and cons and implementation considerations and so on. So there's a lot of benefits to this pattern. First and foremost, clients are more flexible since they don't need to specify the class name of the concrete class and the details of its creation. So you can basically avoid hard coding lexical dependencies on any particular command implementation. As we do here, this is hard coding it into the user code. Instead, we just say, make me a user command that is the print command. And that can be changed. You can modify things. You can call it print this command or print command foo or whatever you want to do. You no longer have any lexical dependencies in your client code. It only works on user command objects. And uh, that's a big win. The downside with this approach is you could end up with a lot of classes, especially if you do the canonical Gang of Four implementation they disclose as their preferred example in the pattern description. That's why I prefer to use a different approach, which we talked about here and we'll talk about more in a second. So one of the implementation considerations is must versus may. <laughs> so if you read the Gang of Four book, you'll see that there's an explicit implementation consideration that deals with this issue of must you derive or may you derive. If you make the creator class abstract, then it must be derived. So that's the must version. But you can also make the concrete class concrete, and then it can define a default factor method, which may handle the bulk of the cases. And then it may be derived if you have to add something else later that you didn't anticipate. Along these lines, then, how, if you decide to go the, the may versus must derive implementation consideration, how is it you indicate what kind of product you want? Well, there's a couple different ways to do it. The most obvious thing to do is pass a parameter. But that raises the question, what type of parameter? You can pass in a, a Java string. You can pass in an enum. You could pass in a const integer, you know, whatever you need to do to indicate the type. A string is more flexible because it's open-ended, whereas an enum is more type safe. So it may turn out that if you know in advance there's only going to be six commands, an enum could be perfectly fine. But it may turn out that you don't know that there are only going to be six commands, in which case a string is going to be more flexible. I typically go with the string approach, but reasonable people may see it differently. Other languages give you some other cool variants of this. For example, in Java, they have this concept of a constructor reference, and that can allow you to reduce the tedium of creating all these derived classes. Uh, so for example, there's this interesting instance in Java, which you can read about at the article at the bottom of the slide, where you have this thing called a shape factory, which is going to make shapes. And as you can see here, we make ourselves a map. That, that shouldn't be a standard map. That should be hash map. My, my, uh, my uh, query replace got a little bit too uh, ambitious here. So you make a Java hash map where you're going to have strings like circle and rectangle point to things known as constructor references, which are basically suppliers that can make objects when their get method is called. And once you've initialized the map, very much like what we showed before when we did the implementation in C++, you go look up into the, the map, you get back a supplier, and if it's assuming it's not null, you can call the get method, and that will make the appropriate derived class. This doesn't scale up. This particular way of doing things doesn't scale up if you have multiple arguments to the shape constructors, but it, it works well if you don't have arguments to the shape constructors. So some other things, if you end up with a bunch of factory methods that have to vary together, then that may lead to a need for another gang of four pattern called the abstract factory. And an abstract factory is just a collection of factory methods that all have to work together in some semantically consistent way. I'll show you some examples, hopefully later in the course, where abstract factory really pays off. And they, they pay off whenever you're making a framework where you have to create a bunch of things that need to be consistent. Uh, a good example, the one the Gang of Four book uses, is you're making a user interface framework and you've got kind of a common look and feel for windows and borders and sliders and radio buttons. And you want them to have sort of a common theme like night theme or day theme or whatnot. And uh, there are lots of different kinds of objects you're creating, but you want to make sure that all objects with a given theme have a common look and feel, but you want to be able to change the look and feel. Again, an example would be night mode versus day mode. If, if you use uh, interactive development environments, they often have like a dark background with lighter text versus a light background with darker text. And different people prefer different shades. But of course, 
if you're doing something, you want to make sure that you don't make a, a one widget with one theme and a different widget to go on the same display with a different theme. That would be inconsistent and bizarre. So abstract factory can be used to collect together a bunch of factory methods and make sure that they're concrete realizations all work together in semantically consistent ways. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later. The key point here is that if abstract factory is really nothing more than just a group of factory methods that work together. There are lots and lots of uses of factory method. I'd say it's probably arguably one of the most common patterns you'll ever run across in practice that's disclosed in the Gang of Four book. And, and I love it. We use it all the time in all the C++ and Java programs that I've ever written, and frameworks and platforms and so on. Uh, another good example would be the iterator factory method in Java's collection interface. Likewise, the begin and end factory methods on C++ containers, they're all basically the same idea. They're creating you something. We use factory method to make it easy to add different types of variabilities within a common and uniform interface. So iterators, commands, visitors, you name it. Factory method decouples the creation of objects from their subsequent use. 